afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zune, and all major podcast providers. You can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter to find out about upcoming guests, features, events, and other shows on our network. If you have any questions or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or send us an email to questions at theorganicview.com. Hello, everyone. This is June Stoyer. As executive producer of the Organic View Radio Network, I'm grateful that we have grown so much in such a short space of time and now have a global audience of over 3 million listeners. Our team truly appreciates your support, especially when it comes to our pollinators. In this special encore edition of the Organic View Radio Show, I think it is important for everyone to hear my very first interview with Tom Theobald and see just how far we've come. For those of you who don't know Tom, he is a commercial beekeeper, honeybee health advocate, and special guest co-host of the Neonicotinoid View Radio Show. Please tune in each Wednesday if you'd like to listen to the show. It has only been a few years since knowledge of the impact of neonicotinoids began to circulate, and now, thanks to many hardworking people from the beekeeping community, as well as other environmental groups, it has become a widely recognized issue that affects each and every one of us. So thank you for tuning in, and please enjoy the show. Today my guest is Tom Theobald, and we're going to be talking about the impact of clothianidin on honeybees. More than 100 agricultural crops in the United States are pollinated by honeybees. Without them, life as we know it would cease to exist. Any fatal impact on the honeybee would create a monumental disaster. Clothianidin has been widely used as a seed treatment on many of the USA's key crops, which include canola, soy, sunflowers, wheat, and sugar beet crops. And for eight growing seasons under a conditional registration, granted, while EPA waited for Bayer Crop Science, the pesticides maker, to conduct a field study assessing the insecticide's threat to bee colony health. The EPA has moved from granting a conditional registration to full registration of this chemical just in time for the spring planting. Clothianidin is of the neonicotinoid family of systemic pesticides, which are taken up by a plant's vascular system and expressed through pollen, nectar, and gutation drops from which bees then forage and drink. Scientists are concerned about the mix and cumulative effects of the multiple pesticides bees are exposed to in these ways. Neonicotinoids are a particular concern because they have cumulative sublethal effects on insect pollinators that correspond to CCD symptoms, and CCD referring to colony collapse disorder, namely neurobehavioral and immune system disruptions. On today's show, we're going to talk to Tom Theobald, who's not only a master beekeeper, but he's president and a founding board member of the Boulder County Beekeepers Association about the impact of this devastating chemical. And it's such a controversial chemical, and the impact to the honeybees is irreparable. So I'd like to welcome Tom to the show. Tom, good afternoon, and welcome to The Organic View. Well, thank you, June, and thank you for having me. I'm looking Uh, forward to talking about this. Uh, It's great to talk to a fellow beekeeper and ally, especially in this whole battle. This has just been tremendous. What I'd first like to do, Tom, is allow you to just talk about yourself and how you got into beekeeping and how your work as a beekeeper led you to where you are today. Sure. I uh, Well, let's start back at the beginning. I I'm a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, and for the first 10 years of my working life, I worked for a major corporation, IBM. You probably have heard the name. And uh, and even at that time, I, I realized that if you were to understand how the world operates, you need to understand how corporations operate. And I had a wonderful opportunity at a young age to be in the smoke-filled rooms and and see decisions being made and understand just how corporations worked. And I, uh, unfortunately, though, my my uh, interest in the corporate world was not 
long term, I really didn't fit too well and really wanted to be outside. And after 10 years, I left not knowing what I might do, but deciding that I was just going to decompress for a while and see what came up and and until the money ran out. And I uh, we'd always had a big garden, and I thought it might be interesting to have a colony or two of bees to complement the garden while I had the time. And and I mentioned that to a neighbor, a retired upholsterer from Boulder, the nearby town, and he said that he had known a, a beekeeper here in Boulder County. And I asked him if he would, if he was still alive, would he speak to me? And I he came back a couple of weeks later and said, yes, he was still alive and he would be happy to speak with me. At the time, this beekeeper was about 90 and lived in a little house in North Boulder. And I spent a delightful afternoon talking to he and his wife about beekeeping and came away with a, a very strong feeling that these two people had done something with their lives that they had really been touched by. That this was there was something much more to beekeeping, and he gave me the name of the man who had what was left of his beekeeping operation, and I called him up in the evening and and offered my my help in return for some experience, and that was the beginning. I helped. His name was Harlan Henderson, and I helped him through this balance of the summer and and through the harvest and did a little research on my own and and began to see that at at one time in history people had actually made a living at beekeeping and I th- decided that I wanted to take a crack at it and that that was what led to where we are today I uh, was one of the founding members of the Boulder County Beekeepers and and was their president for 30 years, but I'm no longer the president, and other other people have taken over those responsibilities. Uh, I think 30 I, years would, is quite a long time, especially to be uh, president, and um, no, that's that's some job. Well, it wasn't like ever anyone was fighting for the job, you know, that was part <laughs> of it, but uh, yeah, that was a long time. Uh, and I've been a beekeeper for 35 years now. I what I would refer to as a community beekeeper. I operate within a fairly limited area and supply primarily a local clientele. And my main source of income is honey, honey sales. I don't take my bees to California in the winter or any of those things that the larger commercial operators would. And uh one of the reasons, interestingly enough, one of the reasons that we formed the Boulder County Beekeepers Association was because in 1975, we had some very serious pesticide problems, some very large bee kills, and we organized the beekeepers so that we could have a single voice to deal with the aerial applicators and work with them, not fight them, but work with them. And the primary purpose of the Beekeepers Association in the beginning was to provide a spray map to the aerial applicators and they would call a representative of the beekeepers association the night before they would spray and we in turn would inform the beekeepers who were going to be in, affected and they could close their bees or in or in some cases move their bees and we were able to reduce the damages from agricultural pesticides. Now, that's something that's very important because there are many areas where there are beekeepers and, unfortunately, uh, unless your state or I think it's – is it the county that requires it or is it at a state level, Tom? Or Here in what? the state That you register with the local county, I guess it is, so that they have to notify you of aerial springs. Well, it's something that has to be created by the beekeepers, and it's not – it's not something that prevails everywhere. In some places, those sorts of relationships have been worked out, and other places, no. Um, we took the initiative here in Boulder County, but there was no requirement, and in the state of Colorado, there's no requirement that you be registered as a beekeeper with the state or anything like that. So the beekeepers took it upon themselves 
to try to deal with this difficulty. And over the years, it was fairly successful. It didn't, it didn't completely eliminate the problem, but it certainly lessened the impact. Things have changed considerably, though. We've gone through uh, several generations of pesticides since the Second World War, and during the time that we were creating the Beekeepers Association, we were dealing mainly with pesticides that were sprayed on agricultural crops. And if you could avoid the damage for the first few days or a couple of weeks in the case of the worst of them, then you could escape that damage. Now we've entered into the world of systemics. The systemics and the ones that we're most directly concerned with right now, uh, clothianidin being one of those, are used as seed treatments and they become systemic to the plant. They're water soluble and as you mentioned at the beginning, they they are taken up by the vascular system of the plant and they're expressed in all the plant parts so that in theory at least, the insects, the predatory insects that chew upon or suck upon these plants are killed. Unfortunately, those those systemic pesticides can also pass through into the pollen and the nectar and affect a, a wide variety of pollinating insects and and it's it's not just the honeybees there are many insects that rely upon the plant world for a protein source in the form of pollen and a carbohydrate source in the form of nectar so they they have been put at risk by this new systemic technology. And in that sense, that's basically going to upset the ecosystem because of the domino effect in which not only does it affect one particular type of insect, but the multi multitude of insects that it does impact. You're talking about all of the predators that prey upon these insects, not to mention the fact that once they're wiped out, then the other animals that feed off of those particular predators. So the list goes on you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, you're talking about a huge upset in the ecosystem, and this is no, you know, no minor little um, uh, situation here. This is, you're talking monumental disaster with this. Well, potentially, uh, that's that's part of the discussion, and the evidence is beginning to emerge that supports just what you've said, that these systemic uh Insecticides, because they're water soluble, they're, they they get into the groundwater. They're cumulative. They can accumulate in the soil with successive plantings of treated seed, which is common practice in the in the corn belt. And, Isn't that what uh, they did with the atrazine, Tom? Well, I I'm not sure. You're you're getting a little out of out of my league here, but. Um, but it's just very hard to get rid of atrazine out of the soil, and now they're starting to realize that uh, you know it was a bad move. But you well, know, they laid they laid many many dollars short. But for, uh, for clothianidin, the research that I've seen says that in heavy soils, the half life of clothianidin is 19 years. So it's very persistent wow. in the soil. It can accumulate. It can be drawn up by subsequent trop, crops which haven't been treated, and it's, it, it has an effect on soil organisms, on earthworms, on freshwater invertebrates, and in Europe particularly, evidence is emerging that uh, it may be having a detrimental effect on many of the bird species that rely upon insects as a primary food source either for adults or for chicks. And I just received a, an email today and just finished reading it about a half hour ago where they're very concerned about what's happening to the bird populations uh, in, in, the, in the form of diseases because one of the effects of the neonicotinoids it appears, and that's that's the broader family that clothianidin is a part of. One of the effects of the neonicotinoids is 
to disrupt the immune system of the insects. And it's it's believed that through this mechanism, it has has produced a variety of disease problems among the bird species, which has contributed to their decline. So it isn't just a lack of forage, a lack of insects. It's the fact that, in effect, the the environment has been given AIDS, immune efficiency disorder. That's one of the things that these pesticides appear to be doing. Wow. And yet, there was granted the full approval by the EPA to move forward from a conditional registration to a full registration, and conveniently just in time for spring planting. Well, let me go back to the beginning so that the listeners can understand the bigger picture. I I, w- I became concerned about two years ago because I was having very high winter losses. And and in the spring, I did a post-mortem on the colonies that had been lost. And it appeared to me that there had been a collapse of those colonies in the fall, I estimated in sometime in October, where the colony had gone from a brood nest that's all the bees and the baby bees and the larva that might be the size of a basketball or a little larger, had suddenly contracted to a brood nest the size of a softball. Wow. Now, it it may not be as clear to non-beekeepers, but it certainly is to me that this is highly irregular and and is one of the reasons why these colonies were not making it through the winter. They just had fallen below critical mass, if you will. So in addition to that, I was seeing very few varroa mites. And varroa mites have been kind of the trash can where we blamed all these loss problems. And uh, I wasn't seeing many mites. My numbers were down. Mite treatments are very expensive. And under the circumstances, I decided that rather than treat broadly, I was going to go through every colony carefully and only treat those ones where I found mites. And I was going to do that in the fall after the harvest. So two years ago when I did that, the first bee yard I went through, I found that colony after colony was broodless. This is in early October at a time when they should have a brood nest the size of a basketball. And they can you explain, cover several frames. Can you explain size, to our listeners that are not familiar with these terms what exactly they mean? Well, the brood nest would be the size of the that the colony is occupying and the brood is in in several stages. I compare it to the butterfly. Most people are familiar with a butterfly. A butterfly lays an egg the egg hatches into a caterpillar. The caterpillar eats leaves, and then it spins a cocoon and pupates. That's the life cycle of a butterfly, and that pupa metamorphoses, changes, and emerges as an adult butterfly. In the bee world, those same things happen, but they happen within the hive. The queen, which is, she's the source of all the eggs in a colony, and there's only one queen in a colony, She lays an egg. In three days, that egg hatches into a teensy tiny little larva, a caterpillar, if you will. But that larva can't go out and forage on its own. It's fed by the younger bees called the nurse bees. And they feed it for the first three days. They feed it a substance called royal jelly, which they produce in special glands by eating pollen. I call it high-octane baby food. (laughs) So for the first three days, that larva is just literally floating in its food source and grows very rapidly. And for the next four days, it's fed a mixture of honey and pollen called bee bread. And then at the end of that period, that larva now has grown 
to fill the cell in the honeycomb. It's larger. It's maybe a half inch long or a little less. It's pretty well filled that cell. Now it spins a cocoon inside that cell, just like a butterfly, a, a caterpillar would out in the field. And the bees cap that cell with a breathable form of beeswax. That larva will now metamorphose, pupate, inside the cell, and in two weeks it will emerge as an adult bee. So that, where that takes place is the brood nest, and that will cover several frames of honeycomb, and in volume be about this, in October would be about the size of a basketball. Does that help? <laughs> I think, well, I, I understand completely, but just just for our listeners that are not quite uh, familiar with uh, it, just uh, bees in general, uh, but um, so you saw a significant decrease. So what I what I saw was that at a time of the year, early October, when a colony should have a brood nest the size of a basketball, there was no brood whatsoever. Now. The brood cycle is a little over three weeks long. So counting back, what that tells me is that brood stopped being produced three weeks before I was looking at them, which would mean the second or third week in September. Now, this is critical to the colony for a couple of reasons. The, the bees are producing at that time of the year what we call the winter bees. The winter bees are physiologically different than the summer bees. They have larger fat bodies and there are other things. And these are the bees that are going to carry the spark of life for that colony through the winter. The summer bees, on the other hand, because they're such hard workers, in the summer their life expectancy is four to six weeks. And those summer bees are going to come to the end of their natural life fairly soon. And this is, I think, why many beekeepers have missed this effect because they wouldn't typically go into the colonies to the degree that I was at that time of the year. They've worked with them all summer. They know their general state. They give them a heft to make sure they're good and heavy. They might pull a frame or two to just take a check, but they wouldn't typically look into the colony in the detail that I was. They look on the outside. They feel very heavy. They see lots of coming and going. They pop the cover and there's a good population of bees and they presume that everything is just fine. What they don't realize is what they're seeing are the summer bees. And those are, going, as I said, going to come to the end of their natural life fairly shortly. But under normal circumstances would be replaced by the winter bees. But there are no winter bees. Those, there's no brood being produced. So obviously the question was, to me, what the heck is going on? And I began to investigate what might be the possible causes for something like that. And because of my prior experience with the problems that they had had with the earlier neonicotinoids, the trail led to clothianidin. And it, it led to it in this way. One of the crops that uh, clothianidin is used as a seed treatment on is corn. Mm. There are 88 million acres of corn in the United States. Corn, although it's wind pollinated, and because it's wind pollinated, because it's wind pollinated, it has to produce billions and billions of pollen spores to assure that pollination takes place. It's a rich pollen source for the honeybees they will exploit that pollen source and it is in such abundance that they store a surplus. Uh -huh. Put it in the pantry, in other words. One of the characteristics of a colony of bees is that they will take fresh pollen in preference to stored pollen if the fresh pollen is available. So as soon as the corn stops tasseling, and that period would be sometime in August in our part of the country, but as soon as the corn stops tasseling, then the bees go back to whatever the pollen of the day is until the middle of September when the natural 
floral spectrum begins to shrink, pollen is no longer available in the abundance that it was, and they begin to tap their stores. They begin to feed that pollen to the queen in the form of royal jelly and to the larva initially as royal jelly, and then if the larva survive as bee bread, pollen and honey directly, and it's doing, my hypothesis was, it's doing exactly what the research tells us it would do. It disrupts the fertility of the queen and the viability of the brood. So uh, now, what did you immediately do when you figured this out? I mean, did you talk to uh, fellow beekeepers? Um, did you call the EPA? What, what was your first reaction? Well, I began doing some investigating on my own <clears throat> to try to understand better whether I was off the mark or whether I was on the right track. And I began investigating on the Internet the the, the characteristics of clothianidin. And and in doing so, I, I discovered how it had been handled by the EPA in a series of memos, EPA memorandum. The first of which was in February of 2003. This was when... Bayer had approached the EPA asking for this product to be registered. And the EPA scientists at that point cited the evidence that came from France, where they'd had such serious problems. France had banned the first neonicotinoid, a metacloprid, in 1999. It was introduced in France and the United States in 1994. France had banned it in 1999 based upon the damage that they believed it was causing to the bee population over there. So the scientists said that there should be a life cycle study, a study of the effects of this product on the queen and the brood over time, and that should be conducted prior to registration. A very sensible approach. Two months later, the second memo, what I call the upon further consideration memo, the EPA uh, scientists agreed to go along with what's called a conditional registration. The condition being the completion of this life cycle study during the first growing season to be delivered to the EPA the following year, by December of the following year. In itself a very generous step, this product had very serious questions, and yet they proposed to release it to the market and answer those questions after the fact. What I've called using the environment as the experiment and us as the experimental subjects. So the, the, uh, the life cycle study, the the, the the application was for the uh, registration of clothianidin as a seed coating on corn and canola. Now, wasn't it primarily just used on canola, not corn? No, it was it, it was to be used on both. And one of the, the things that happened was Bayer prevailed upon the EPA to do the study on canola. And not in the United States, as EPA scientists had, had said earlier, it should be done. But they decided to do it on canola and disregard corn, even though corn is known as, as a rich pollen source. And we had had similar problems with a product called encapsulated parathion in the 90s, which was used on corn to control corn rootworm. And... The vector was pollen, and that was well known, and yet the EPA allowed Bayer to do the study in Canada on canola. In the United States, canola represents less than a million acres. Corn represents about, as I said earlier, 88 million acres. Now, it should have been done on both of those crops. 
it, exactly. But my question is, why is it that we're using tests that are done offshore instead of on our own land, where we can keep a close eye on it and um, have, you know, have the data analyzed uh, properly instead of, you know, off, out of our borders where it's, you know, who, who knows what is involved and how it's being, how, how the results are being influenced. Well, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer for it. Um, it was the study itself, though, that was of great concern. And what it consisted of was four, four bee yards, let's call them, each of which was situated on two and a half acres planted from treated canola seed, four colonies on each of those two and a half acre plots. I use the analogy of, of being concerned about a noxious weed that was affecting your cattle and planting two and a half acres of that noxious weed and putting four cows on that two and a half acres, but don't fence those two and a half acres. Those cows are free to roam the world. Bees typically forage a mile to two miles from their colony. That two and a half acres represents an insignificant part of their forage area. And of course, <laughs> the suspect chemical did not show up to any degree in the samples. And that was not, by design. The, the, the uh, variables were manipulated to, in their favor, period. Of course. I mean, you can do any type of study to uh, sway the results so that they come out in a particular favor if you just simply set it up as such. I mean, that's just common sense. And, and so, you can see that. I can see that. My granddaughter, who's in the sixth grade, can see that. But that that life cycle study was completed in August of 2006. Despite the controversy and despite the fact that we were waiting for the results of this, the EPA sat on it for 15 months and didn't review it until November of 2007. Was there and any concluded particular... right at the outset, this is sound science. That's the, now, that was the response. This was the study that was the contingency upon which conditional registration was granted the completion of which cleared the way for full registration. I wrote an article in the J July 2010 issue of Bee Culture magazine where I outlined pretty much what I have been saying here and called into question the validity of that study. I got a call in November from a person at EPA headquarters who said, Tom, I wanted you to be the first to know that, and I don't know whether it was because of my article or partly because of my article or what, Bayer had come back and requested registration for clothianidin as a seed treatment on mustard and cotton. Yes, and so the it's EPA the scientists had gone yeah. back and reviewed the initial study and had concluded that it was not sound science. So now we have a product that's been on the market for eight growing seasons that has failed to satisfy the requirements for registration. What do you do with it? Well, if the government uh, agency that's supposed to be the watchdog is not watching out, what options do we really have? Well, the EPA proposes just business as usual. Now they're trying to dismiss this study, which was critical to the registration of this product, as insignificant. Oh, it didn't really matter. Because so who got, they, who got I the believe handout? because they don't want to face what's been done. Who got the handout is what I'm wondering. Well, I don't know. Mm. So the question that's before us right now is, what is the disposition of this product? It has failed to satisfy the requirements for registration. The EPA has failed to explain on what basis they propose to continue its registration and sale. I think the American people deserve an answer. I think the American people definitely deserve an answer, but the, the thing is, is that once it spreads like wildfire here, it's also going to affect 
uh, everywhere else. I mean, this is just really um, – it's it's complete devastation. And the thing is, Tom, I mean, at this point, what do you recommend that beekeepers do? I mean, uh, writing to a local congressman, what what do you suggest that we do to try to stop this? Because uh, we have such a short space of time before the spring crops are planted. Well, I think that... Uh... I think all the systems that we have put in place to prevent this sort of thing have failed us. Congress has had ample opportunity to step in here and stem this tide, and they have failed to do so. The EPA appears to want to just sweep this under the rug and not face it, and the corporations are unlikely to come forward and reform themselves. So I think what it means is that this falls to the people to change these things, to make it clear that this is no longer acceptable. I've, I've said many times before, and I still believe, that most of the EPA employees want to do the right thing. They are not our adversaries. They are our allies. They want to change things and do things right just as much as we do. They're hamstrung by a management that has failed to carry out their responsibilities to protect the American public and the environment. I completely agree. I mean, I have many colleagues that uh, work in various capacities uh, in the EPA, and, you know, they're they're good people. But uh, obviously this is an order that's coming from the top. So, I mean, what choices do we have? Well, the only choice we have is to make it a public issue to smoke these people out and force them to face their responsibilities before the public. These people work for us. We have a right to demand that they carry out their responsibilities the way they're supposed to. So what do you recommend as far as seeking action? What can the public do? Well, what I've said over the last month, we made a national press release on December 8th, and And at that same time, a letter went to Lisa Jackson, who's the administrator of the EPA, calling this chemical into question. We're going into our ninth week. There's yet to be an answer to that letter. I think that I think we need to demand that the EPA come forward and face the music and 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 explain to the American people what they propose to do with this product. And now, this now, has been how many months where you haven't received a response? It's nine weeks, nine weeks. And and we're reaching the critical point. And I'm beginning to suspect, along with others, that what they want to do is they want to stall this situation until the coming year's seed crop has been treated and then it becomes a moot point. Now, I recognize that if they ban this product there's going to be an enormous disruption in agriculture because you have farmers on nearly 88 million acres of corn who have adapted their system to accommodate these systemic pesticides. It's going to be a huge disruption. But it's a disruption, it's a garden path that they've been led down by the failure of the EPA to, to carry out its responsibilities. And because... Bayer Corporation was content to float this bogus scientific study past the EPA in order to accomplish that. You know, it's very interesting. There's an allegation been raised, and it seems to me there is some substance to it, that clothianidin was rushed to the market not because it was a unique solution to an insect problem, but because the patent was about to run out on imidacloprid the first of the neonicotinoids. So we've been subjected to these dangers, not just the beekeepers, but the environment has been subjected to these dangers to protect the market share of a corporation. And has there been any response by the Bayer Corporation? Well, what response there has been has been that that they – the registration was based on a peer-reviewed scientific study, and they 
they talk about uh, you know how how important it was what they failed to address is the fact that the EPA has rejected it it doesn't matter whether it was peer reviewed or not the EPA has rejected it so they're playing hide and seek the EPA is playing playing duck and cover they they want to play word games and argue whether this was a core study or not if you look through the the memoranda you can see very quickly that it was critical to the registration of this product and at this point what i ask people to to do at this point is take the time to take a look at the documentation and understand it well enough so that as we enter into these discussions, we have an educated public who can stand with us. Now, Tom, they count can, on our ignorance. Where can people get a copy of this documentation? They from? can go. They can go to three websites. We have a local website which is BoulderCountyBeekeepers.org. One word, no caps. Where we've tried to put all the pertinent information. We've mm-hmm. put. The article that I wrote, we've put the press release, the letter to Lisa Jackson, the supposed leaked memo, uh, some of the earlier reports. It's all there for people to look at, and they don't have to accept my judgment. They can reach their own conclusions. They can take a look at this life cycle study, and they can see what it consisted of, and they can they can draw their own conclusions as to whether this is sound science or not. And and as we enter into this public discussion, hopefully we will, we'll have an informed public who can enter into it along with us. We cannot do this alone. The other uh, two websites would be the Pesticide Action Network, PANA, P-A-N-N-A dot org, and BeyondPesticides dot org. Both of those have quite a bit of this information on their websites. Thank you. That's, uh, you know, I, I will, uh, I encourage anybody that's listening out there, uh, whether you're listening to the live uh, broadcast of this program or the podcast, to please, you know, read this documentation. Because the thing is, folks, this isn't just, you know, some guy who has some bees just complaining because his bees are dying. Uh, Tom, I, I want you to really emphasize the big picture here. What, how much, what kind of devastation are we looking at, and to what magnitude? So that the folks out there that may or may not really have given it much thought can really understand what this is going to boil down to. Well, all of these are arguable, and if you're on the side of the pesticide industry, you would you would refute most of what's come out. But the evidence is emerging that, among other things, these these neonicotinoids are compromising the immune systems of not only the insect world and the soil organisms and the freshwater invertebrates, but may also be affecting bird species. I've, I've begun to question whether this may be a, a part of the problem that we're seeing with the bats. The white nose syndrome, which is my understanding is a fungus, what these appear to be doing is they make the insects, in the case of the bees, uh, vulnerable to a whole host of things that otherwise wouldn't be a problem. This is comparable to HIV. They don't die from the chemical itself necessarily. They die from the fact that their immune system has been compromised and they can't stave off commonly occurring pathogens and viruses and funguses. And it's important to understand that this may have very far-reaching effects and may be very long-lasting. And if Dr. Tenekes is correct, and I have no reason to believe that he isn't, the effect of these on the nerves, nervous synapses are cumulative and irreversible. And the evidence has emerged recently that it very tiny amounts can have very dramatic effects. This is plutonium for the bees, apparently. And actually, uh, folks, for those of, of you that are listening live, tomorrow's guest is going to be Dr. Hank Tenekes, 
uh, and we're going to be discussing this very issue. Uh, but uh, this is just this is just so um, upsetting uh, and outrageous that we're trusting this agency to protect us through taxpayers' dollars, and yet it seems as though the only interests that seem to be of any concern are the big corporations. Well, there's there are several issues here. The first is the disposition of Clothianid, and that needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed immediately. But this is only one chemical. There are multiple chemicals out there, and in many cases, uh, they're used as tank mixes. In other words, they're mixed together, and they potentiate each other in ways that increase their effects a thousandfold or more. There, nobody is looking at that. Um, we 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 need to dis, we need to address clothianidin, but there are many others. And what we really need to look at is the failure of the regulatory system, which brought us to this point. Because if we don't, a year from now or six months from now, we'll just be dealing with something else that slipped through the safety net, and something else will be killing us. The system that's intended to prevent these kinds of things has failed us. And the EPA at this point appears to want to be able to just pick and choose from among the regulations and laws which it chooses to honor and ignore those which are inconvenient to it or its corporate clients. And if they're allowed to do that, there is no law. Yeah, there is no nothing. It's it's almost like a facade to give the illusion that, oh, there's something that's there to protect you, but the reality is is that no, whoever's got the most money wins. Yes. And the sad reality is nobody's going to win with this particular chemical because, did you say 19 years it stays in the soil? That's the, in heavy soils. It can have a half-life of up to 19 years, yes. 19 years, folks. That is a very long time. And to just try to do anything with that soil, you're talking about a contamination as opposed to just an application that's supposed to help propagation. And that's the irony you know, of the whole thing. One of the thing. arguments that's used in favor of the neonicotinoids is that they have eliminated the use of many other chemicals. And in fact, they have. But you need to understand that the reason we have such a severe insect problem with corn is because it's it's farmed industrially. Many of these insect problems could be relieved with things as simple as soil rotation. But industrial agriculture prefers to do corn on corn on corn. In other words, turn America into a corn factory. And the question is, how many sacrifices should we make to the environment to enable this kind of industrial agriculture? Well, I'm not opposed fact- to the farmers, and I sympathize with their problems. Many of the farmers are my friends. But just what kind of sacrifices can we be expected to make to prop up industrial agriculture? Well, Tom, I've had a number of uh, leaders in the farming community that have spoken out about the lack of the rotation of crops, and they agree wholeheartedly that there needs to be some rotation. Actually, I interviewed uh, Bud Schultz, who's the president uh, or the chairman of the North American Hemp Industrial Association. And uh, hemp, if, if what's interesting is, is that the uh, they will not allow hemp to be grown on U.S. soil, even though it's, uh, it's very economical. It also um, is very easy to grow, and it would really balance out the soil in between these uh, the the, the uh, sowing of these other crops, but uh, the DEC will not, or the DEA will not allow it because they still classify hemp to be, um, you know, that of marijuana. The devil's workshop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is that you know there are many. I I support uh, the U.S. dairy farmers as well as other farmers. And I have spoken out about some of the things that have been going on where uh, these farmers are really, really being 
suppressed and they are um they're trying to basically wipe them out so that all the big factory farms can exist and we can inevitably be dependent upon importing all of our food because if it's grown offshore how are we going to know what's really in it and you know it's going to lead to other things but the farmers uh, are as much victims of this as the beekeepers it just isn't as clear to them yet yeah exactly and well just the fact that 19 years in your soil that's kind of scary that's a very long time to have any type of chemical in your land. Well, you know, to get back to what I was saying just a minute ago, the systemic insecticides have replaced other applications of insecticides that were problematical for the bees and for the environment. But the argument is that's being made is it would be like being accosted by a mugger who says, I'm not going to shoot you, I'm not going to stab you, I'm just going to give you AIDS, or I'm going to give you cancer. And we're supposed to be thankful for that. We must do better. Yeah, it's really disturbing that all these things are just happening all at once, it seems. And, you know, the fact that even the USDA, with the news of the deregulation of the genetically engineered crops, that's all this stuff just seems to play hand in hand. Yes, Roundup, Roundup Ready Alfalfa, and we're very concerned about the effect of Roundup on the bees. There need to be great changes made, and only the public can bring those to happen. So, do you think that it would be? of the people who are out there supposedly acting in our best interests are doing what they should. I'm very disappointed with Congress, and not just within the last month or two, but over a period of time. They haven't stepped up to this. I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed with the major media. If you Google this subject, you will find literally dozens of well-thought-out, well-written articles that have been done. What have you seen in the major media outlets? Absolutely Not nothing. Not a whisper. Why is that? The only reason that I found out about it is basically because of my fellow beekeepers. When you're involved in the agricultural and horticultural communities, it's hard not to hear about these things because word spreads like wildfire, so to speak. But mainstream media, point blank, it's owned. And especially you can't have one of these journalists put it on the nightly news because, lo and behold, their sponsors are you know, big yep. agrochemical companies. So you know, there you have it. Once again, Tom, do you think that it's it would be even helpful if the public reached out to the EPA and said, we'd like to know what you intend to do about this? Well, they've been reaching out over the past two months. There have been petitions circulated that I'm told have more than a million signatures in some cases, and the EPA has not responded. You can go to their website where they put out their initial response to this, which was basically that we don't know what we're talking about, that this wasn't an important study. I would invite people to go to one of those websites and take a look at the the trail, of, the paper trail, the memos, and it's very clear in the EPA's own words and own documents that this was a critical study critical to the registration of this product. Now that it's failed, now that the bogus science has been uncovered, they want to sweep it under the rug. That's not good enough. No, it's not this, good enough. This non-response has been a tactic that they have used for years so that people who were concerned about an issue would ultimately become frustrated and disappear. And it's worked for them very well in the past. Well, it's not going to work anymore. But as far as the people contacting them, they have been contacting them in droves over the past two months, and there's been no response. Why do you think that they are choosing not to respond to millions of people? Because, well, I, I can't answer for them, but I think that this is a very serious problem. They're just hoping it goes away. They don't want to explain anything what if they what if they do decide that they because of the law they have to ban this product what is the reaction going to be in the farm community 
It's a horrible problem, and I sympathize with the farmers. Well, the bottom line is is that uh, what are we looking at as far as our future, Tom? Well, I don't. I think it looks dark if we don't start applying some good sense to these decisions. Well, they and say, you'll you'll hear much more in much greater detail from Dr. Tenekis. He is they, a scientist. He understands the science. He will he will tell you much more. And I encourage your listeners to tune in and hear what he has to say. Thank you. Hypothetically speaking, say if things proceed as they have planned and they apply this pesticide what are you faced with this fall tom what are you looking at as far as all of your hives and how many hives do you have well my objective is to have a hundred colonies and i do what's called two queen beekeeping a two queen colony is like a high powered colony i could be history in another year or two I've been faced with the same kinds of losses that the larger commercial beekeepers have. Uh, winter losses on the order of 30 to 60 percent, and you can't you can't suffer those kinds of losses to your base for too long before the line goes to zero. Um, it does. I, I just won't be able to keep enough bees alive to make the business viable. You know, basically, there's got to be more money coming in than going out. And what is this going to mean for uh, anyone who farms organically? I can imagine that this is going to completely devastate any effort. Well, organically uh, or inorganically, it, there are... About a third of our food supply depends upon that pollination connection. About a third of American agriculture, a third of what we eat. Somewhere between 90 and 130 major food crops are dependent upon that pollination connection. The almonds, for example, are a multi-billion dollar California crop, and they depend directly upon the honeybee. If you have two colonies of bees per acre, I'm told the production is on the order of 2,600 pounds of almonds. If you have no bees, you have no almonds. If you have no bees, you have no food, period. Right. It never ceases to amaze me how these big corporations can put out these wonderful products and only think about their bottom line, but they don't think about the big picture about what's affected. And maybe that's understandable, but we put agencies like the EPA in place to balance that, to balance those interests against the the broader interests of society and to protect mankind and the environment. And they have not done so. At least it appears in this case that they have faltered severely. That's basically who we're supposed to go to. I mean, who else can help us at this point? There isn't anybody. I don't know. You know, where where do you go? We've gone to Congress when we first began seeing these high losses. There were congressional hearings. Congress uh, evidenced a great deal of sympathy, said that there was going to be $100 million in the farm bill, and that turned into $20 billion, or million, excuse me, million. And what trickled out of the end of the pipeline was $4 million. The, EP, the USDA couldn't account for where the $20 million went. I mean, what kind of mismanagement do we have here? Someone needs to start looking into this. Where is Congress? Where are these people? Well, I'm not sure where they are, but I do know that they have better health care than I have. And Of course uh, they do. It's just disturbing that this is where our votes are going to support people that are not doing their jobs and yep. not supporting the interests that they're supposed to. But yet, uh, when it comes to special interest groups, their interests are always are always of a concern. And at this particular point, it, you know, I have a lot of colleagues that are overseas that are just like, what's going on in the States? You know, what are they doing? Because they know what's coming their way. Because after, mm-hmm. after it wreaks havoc here... It travels over the river and through the woods, so to speak, yeah. across the pond and everywhere else. 
for those of you that are listening outside the United States, yeah, you better believe this is going to be an issue that you're going to be dealing with very soon, if not already. Tom, can you repeat the, the three websites that you mentioned before? BoulderCountyBeekeepers.org, Pana, P-A-N-N-A dot org, BeyondPesticides.org. Thank you, Tom. And how can our audience get in touch with you if they want to find out more information or get in touch with you? Maybe there are teachers or uh, organizations that would like to connect with you and to help raise awareness. Well, probably the best way would be through the Boulder County Beekeepers. Uh, You have to understand that I'm a one-man operation here. I don't have a staff. I don't have a secretary. I can only do so much. So if I get buried in requests and phone calls, it's going to be hard. I'm drinking at the fire hose as it is, but I'll try to help wherever I can. And through the Boulder County Beekeepers website, that'd probably be the best way. Thank you so much. And Tom, thank you once again for coming on the show. It has been really interesting learning about everything that you've been fighting for and to also raise awareness about this crisis. I mean, this is just unbelievable. And folks, please get involved. And as I said, Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you, June, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Everyone, we are out of time. But thank you so much for tuning in. And if you've missed the show, you can always subscribe to The Organic View on iTunes or visit our podcast archives at www.theorganicview.com. Have a great day, everyone.